whose title? They answered, the emperor's. Then he said to them, give therefore to the emperor the things that are the emperor's and to God the things that are God's. When they heard this, they were amazed and they left him and went away. This is the gospel of our Lord. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. I'm going to uh, begin with a prayer, and that prayer, if I can find it, I got from our ELW, uh, the Evangelical Lutheran Book of Worship that we sing out of. There are many prayers in there, and I needed that prayer to help me write this sermon with all the cacophony of violence in the Middle East and elsewhere. There's just way too much violence. Okay, let's uh, find the prayer, Tom. You, you know, you would think that uh, I would have this ready. Okay, it's here. It's at the beginning. Um, if you aren't used to uh, reading the uh, marvelous Cranberry hymnal that we have, you should know that even Martin Luther's small catechism is at the back of that hymnal. And all kinds of really well thought out prayers. And this one I needed, and I used it every day this week to write the sermon. Let us pray. Gracious God, grant peace among nations. Cleanse from our own hearts the seeds of strife, greed, and envy, harsh misunderstandings and ill will, fear and desire for revenge. Make us quick to welcome ventures in cooperation among the peoples of the world so that there may be woven the fabric of a common good too strong to be torn by the evil hands of war. In the time of opportunity, make us be diligent, and in the time of peril, let not our courage fail. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. 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 That, that prayer was uh, in my heart and in my mind uh, each time I returned to tweak the sermon, to think about what was needed most uh, at this particular time in our lives. Grace and peace to you through Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world. Amen. Whose image is stamped on you? In whose image are you made? That's the issue in the gospel today. And it's the question Jesus answers for the Pharisees and Herodians, although they really weren't looking for that answer, were they? Some Pharisees and their disciples, as it turns out, and some Herodians came to Jesus under the supervision of the Pharisees, you know, uh, great legal experts of the Jewish faith. And they said to Jesus, in order to trap him, should we pay taxes to the emperor or not? Well, it's a good question, really. And it's uh, been a question that's worried many people over the centuries, many Christians. Do you pay taxes to uh, an occupied military regime that kills people? You know, uh, it's a tough one. Even for today, we should be wondering these questions. But really, the Pharisees weren't interested in that. It was a trick question, see? Remember, in Jesus' day, no question was neutral, especially for the men that gathered at the gate who fenced with words. Remember, the Mediterranean culture was based on shame and honor, and uh, they fenced. They, like, like in fencing, you stab, and then there's repost. You know, you throw out something, and they respond with it. They love to do this, and they still do in the Middle East. And the idea was to expose some shame and to see if you're an honorable person or not. Jesus knew the game. Jesus was good at it, as you see. You just read the Gospels, and all the time he's having these conversations, and, and usually he gets the better of them. You know, that's, that's great. Uh, we shouldn't... Uh, you know, be so proud of that. What he was doing in those conversations was moving them to understand the gospel, the good news of God's love for all people. Okay. Uh, 
should we pay the tax to the emperor or not? It was a head tax. So every human being, male and female, and every kid over 12 was supposed to be uh, paying this denarius, which is a day's wage, once a year, to live in the comfort of Rome. <laughs> They're overlords, see? The ones who could kill you at any moment, that's how, they, that's how they provided the Pax Romana, the peace, by killing people that they were, thought were troublemakers, like Jesus. Should we pay that tax? And uh, they had the answer, as it turns out, in their pocket, didn't they? And Jesus knew it. Um, they had the coin, the denarius, because Jesus asked for it, and one of them was naive enough to give it to him, he knew it. And just remember, for the Jewish people, uh, especially the Pharisees, you don't touch the denarius, why? It had the picture of Tiberius Caesar on it, on one side. And so it was a graven image, wasn't it? That's against the law. Uh, and the Pharisees devised ways to handle a denarius without not touching it. You know, they were good at that kind of stuff. The fence around the fence around the fence of the law so that they never, uh, you know, made a sin evident to anybody. Um, my friend John Dominic Cross, and I got to know him a couple of decades ago, I invited him to uh, some seminars for our people in Minnesota. And he brought along once to one of his seminars a replica of this coin. And he showed it to us. And there was the head of... Tiberius Caesar, and on, on one side, and on the back side it says this, it's inscribed this, Tiberius Caesar Augustus, son of the divine Augustus. In other words, son of God. Son of God. And these coins were not found, or have been found, not just in Rome, but in other areas of Rome's empire. And Jews did not like to look at it, touch it. Jesus says, show me the coin. And one of them brings it out from his pocket, his pocket, whatever his garment had. And uh, Jesus already in his first stab got him, see? Oh, but he doesn't, Jesus doesn't make a big thing of it. He just got him. And uh, he knew that if he said to the question, should we pay taxes to the emperor? It was a no-win situation. Because if he said, no, you shouldn't pay the tax, he'd be in trouble with the Roman police. See? And of course, he did get in trouble with the Roman police. And when the Pharisees were gathering around Pilate and getting everyone to say, crucify him, they said, remember, he told us not to pay taxes. So they, they thought they got him. If he said, yes, you should pay the tax, well, the general population would dislike him for being a collaborator with Rome, see? So that's, this is how uh, thrust and repost, challenge, fencing back and forth. And Jesus says, show me the coin. I love this, it's brilliant. And after they give it to him, he said, and he takes it, no problem. He says, uh, whose head is on it? Whose image is on it? And they say, the emperor's. Well, then give it back to the emperor, he says. And here's where I wish in my little fantasy world, that there'd been an iPhone with a nice video on it back then, and someone took a picture and the voice of Jesus, because I think, and I make Jesus say this, that he said the second part like this, and give to God the things that belong to God, like slower and more intent. Give it to the emperor, that's his. But give to God. You who have ears to hear, I think he would have said. Everything that belongs to God, like your life, your priorities, everything you got. See, whose image is imprinted on you? Who do you belong to? To the Blessed Trinity, of course. Your creator, your redeemer, your advocate, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. I love what uh, St. Augustine does with the creation stories in Genesis. You may know this. Um, he said Genesis 1 is where God creates 
the cosmos and human beings in God's mind. Nothing happens. It's all, it's this little interplay between the Son, the Spirit, and the Father. Let's make a marvelous creation in our image. Yes. So that they will live like us. The Spirit loves the Son, loves the Spirit, loves the Father, loves the Son. This divine dance, perichoresis in Greek. It's all in God's mind. Nothing happens yet. And in chapter 2, you have this, as St. Augustine says, this marvelous poem of creation, which teaches the truth. God is our creator. Okay. Um, let us make human beings in our image, so in God's own image and likeness, God created them. Chapter 1. You are created in God's image. Or in St. Paul's marvelous and courageous statement in Ephesians, before the foundation of the world, God chose you to be holy, set aside, with a purpose, and this purpose is of love. And that's a paraphrase on my part, but that's what it means. You were chosen to be a blessing to the whole world, to be a sign of God's love. And may I say parenthetically, you are. I go to people's houses in this congregation, and I meet with marvelous people made in God's image, some of whom can't come anymore. And they bless me with the image of God in them. Sure, it's always, well, the pastor's coming for pastoral care, and I love it. But the pastor gets care from you. Did you know that? So many of you already in my short time here have already given me courage, empowered the Christ image in me, see? That's how that works. Now, we have God's image imprinted on us, and we, it, we explain by modeling that image when we love other people the way God does, unconditionally. And as Christians, we make the sign of the cross. I do this often because I need to remember who I am. It helps me. Incidentally, my grandfather, a 100% Norwegian named Oli, my mother's father, I loved him so much. He was a farmer in northwestern Minnesota where all those Lutherans from Norway and Sweden gathered, although he liked Norwegians better than Swedes and made that clear. But I would go up to the farm in the summers when I was a kid and uh, I was scared of the upstairs room, six bedrooms upstairs, because all these farmers, you know, they, they uh, bred like rabbits. You know, they had to have all these kids to milk the cows and everything. And it was scary up there. And my grandfather said, and he said it like this, Thomas, you stay with me in my bedroom. Sleep with me. And I did, and I loved it. And every night, this old Norwegian with his wrinkled skin, I would look up at him, kneeling at the side of the bed next to him. And he would start praying in Norwegian. It was about a half hour prayer. <laughs> On my knees. I can still, in my mind's eye now, I can see Grandpa Oli, his sincerity. And he'd be, it sounded something like this, and making all this up. I don't know how to speak Norwegian. <laughs> it sounded like that. But you know what he would do? He would go through the list of every neighbor and every member of his family. And I listened, it was all in Norwegian, until I could hear Thomas. I heard my name on the lips of my grandpa, praying. Okay. We share the image of God when we show what Grandpa Oli showed me, by example, to love everyone. And my mother said once, oh yes, he's been praying for, and I won't give you his name, one of the neighbors he really doesn't like. <laughs> That's the image of God in us. Hey, we don't have to force ourselves to feel real good about it, just do it. You know, I learned that from Grandpa. Grieving Jewish families burying their dead in Israel are made in the image of God. Palestinian families leaving their dead behind as they rush through Gaza to the southern border are made in the image of God. Palestinian Christians, there are only 50,000 left, who are caught in the crossfire are made in the image of God. One of the parishioners that I didn't like very well in my second call, I can still see him. 
is made in the image of God. Because this is not a parochial faith we have. It's a Catholic faith. Universal. Don't truncate Jesus. The whole world is made in the image of God. And if we could come around to that, imagine what would happen to war, violence, bloodshed. And what Jesus was teaching the Pharisees and Herodians, and of course, it was at the city gate because that's where they liked to meet. All these people heard it, overheard this, were made in the image of God. Whose image is stamped on you, Jesus is saying to the Pharisees. Is it the emperor's? Or is it God's? And he knew they really knew the answer. He got them twice. See? With love. It's not like he got them like it was some sort of war. He got them because he was the son of God. He was Jesus. I will tell you my personal witness. Jesus Christ for me, as understood in the scripture and the creeds, is the uncreated life, way, and truth. You know that from the Gospel of Matthew. I am the way, the truth, and the life for everyone. But not everybody knows it. The church's job is to be a sign that Jesus is the Savior of the whole world. No exceptions. And this Christ is a mystery. We don't fully understand it. But he is the Savior of the whole world. And he's bigger than the Christian church. And we have these great theologians that are reminding us of this all the time. And if we don't understand that, we'll never be able to build bridges with people of other religions. Or people who have no religion. Or our atheist and agnostic friends, see? And we'll never understand that in the image of God imprinted in us, and in the call of God before the foundation of the world, we are to be ambassadors of grace, as Paul says in Corinthians. And reconcilers with God of the world. See? Uh, a short quote from Martin Luther, but first, I must say that I love Martin Luther, but I do not worship him. <laughs> he said some marvelous things, and he said some awful things, and you may know that ELCA has already apologized to the Jewish community for the awful things that Luther said about the Jews and Turks. But that doesn't erase the powerful gospel message that he passionately Proclaim. This is one of my favorite, from the freedom of a Christian, Martin Luther. We conclude, therefore, that a Christian lives not in himself or herself, but in Christ and in the neighbor. For he lives in Christ by faith, and he lives in the neighbor by what? Love. And then he adds, otherwise he's not a Christian. Pretty powerful words. We live our life in Christ by faith, trust, and we live our lives in our neighbor through love. Whether we feel real good about that neighbor or not makes no difference. So, uh, you may know, because it's printed in your bulletin, that a Methodist church, Riverton Methodist, I believe, is now uh, housing 400 immigrants seeking legal asylum. I don't know where they are. I can't pronounce the name. Anyway, uh, they are reaching out for others to help them. There's a, about 100 people in tents right now. And uh, Cindy made me aware of it. She said, you can go online. It's the easiest thing in the world. You go to Amazon, you go to their site, and you pick out what you want for those kids and those adults. I have an eight-year-old granddaughter. I picked out some tights in light of her. So I thought about her, see, living in those tents. And I have a grandson, six. I got some jeans for him on Amazon. It took me about two and a half minutes. They don't have to be explosive acts, see. The smallest act of kindness done in God's name through God's love is so powerful. Don't be fooled by how small it is or how quiet it is. It's very easy to do. I encourage you to look it up. And I got that information from you guys, from Agnus Day. Think about the way you are living out the image of God. And it is powerful for other people to see modeled. Yesterday is gone. Tomorrow has not yet come. Live the image of God and the gospel of Christ today. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.